Welcome to the best of the day on uh, European perspective in lung cancer that was held in Torino in uh, the last two days. I had the privilege to share these uh, highlights with uh, the co-chairman of the meeting, Professor Pete Posmos and Giorgio Scagliotti from the University of Torino. Professor Pete Posmos is from the University of Liverpool. Over the last three, two days, we were discussing, we were reviewing the current uh, available evidence and the current standard of care in uh, uh, advanced nosmo cell lung cancer as well as in early stages uh, lung cancer. So I would like to start these highlights asking to Professor Posmos which are the latest information and which are the current uh, guidelines for the treatment of early stage nosmo cell lung cancer and how we can uh, our, in our daily practice, prevent lung cancer? Okay, thank you for giving me these questions. So what was uh, addressed during this meeting is uh, especially the, the screening programs that uh, are being set up in the US uh, that was addressed by Professor John Field from Liverpool. And uh, he was talking as well about the way he uh, we might enrich the population to be um, to to detect as many cancers as possible in the in the, the, the population that is at risk. So, a kind of risk score for people who have uh, smoked uh, or hardly ever smoked, and those are the ones that are going to be invited for a screening program uh, in the UK, um, and. Next to that, he was addressing um, the still ongoing uh, analysis of the Nelson trial, which is the European trial that has to confirm, hopefully, what has been found in the NLST trial that has been performed in the US. So the US is now already uh, taking uh, the, the message from that trial into their daily practice and uh, consider screening as one of the things that needs to be done for those who are in the high risk groups, whereas in Europe, uh, there's still no, um, not sufficient, uh, consider there's not sufficient evidence, so they are waiting for the NLST, uh, the, the Nelson trial, uh, and then they're going to imply that uh, most likely with a kind of selection procedure based on the risk factors of these patients. So that is for uh, detecting uh, the early lung cancer what to do with early lung cancer, that has not changed over time. Uh, early lung cancer is the best candidate for surgery, unless a patient has too much comorbidity or is too old or too unfit uh, to do that. And then there might be a possibility to go for a radical radiotherapy, uh, often described as Sabers or stereotactic ablative radiotherapy, which has been addressed as well by Professor Brada from Liverpool. So uh, with regard of all this, um, these patients will be investigated when they present and then they come for a kind of staging procedure. And these staging procedures that are, is a, is a work in progress in fact, uh, at the um, upcoming World Lung Cancer Meeting in, in Denver, the, the staging committee of the ISLC is going to present the, uh, the, the data they collected during the last five, six years on uh, a large number of cases, over 80,000, and that might be a reason to modify the current uh, system, the UICC-7, uh, and adopt uh, the new findings and uh, uh, imply the new findings into that staging system. And a few things that are already uh, becoming clear from uh, analysis of different groups are that the, the, the thing that was brought into, um, into focus the last time is the, the degree of pleural invasion uh, by a tumor adjacent to the pleural might affect the, uh, the staging of, uh, the, the, especially the T staging. So I expect that the um, the, the large database of the ISLC will address that question as well, as well as this uh, patient group that has now been uh, collected the data on, is the first group in which the, the role of PET um, has become much more prominent than in the previous databases because there was no PET use at all. So 
hopefully that will bring um, a more a more detailed and more specified uh, specifically addressed um, staging system uh, in again a huge database let's go back for one second to the screening uh, uh, tool that is mainly represented by low dose uh, CT scan and as you said there is the attempt to in to increase the proportion of patients who are positive at the at the at the at the screening using a sort of a set of enrichment criteria do you believe that also the lung function test should be included among this uh, selection criteria considering the data the original data showing that in the presence of uh, different levels of obstructive lung disease there was an increased risk of uh, of uh, of getting positive results from the from the CT scan yeah i think that is uh, certainly a thing that needs to be uh, incorporated um, and and the main reason for that is especially in europe and, and, and uh, the uk is the best example for that if the enrichment is not done in the most optimal way the cost of screening will become too high and that would make it almost impossible for a lot of countries to to introduce this on a large scale so um, it's really very important that you try to make something as effective as possible in this situation to reduce the costs so moving uh, to another uh, area of, uh, of interest uh, that has been extensively discussed in these two days uh, we had a special session uh, devoted to immunotherapy in the field of lung cancer. It was really an exciting time because uh, we learned a lot about the, the basic principles of, uh, of immunotherapy from Dr. Rivoltini and then uh, the uh, two subsequent speakers, Dr. Dr. Mayo and Dr. Van Stenkist, were respectively reviewing the existing evidence about immune checkpoints and vaccines in the field of lung cancer. At the end of the session, a radiologist, Dr. Barry, was discussing extensively, was presenting also clinical cases, how to evaluate the radiologically the efficacy of immunotherapies in, in lung cancer. Well, uh, I would like to come back to you about this, uh, this issue. Immunotherapy is not something really new in the field of lung cancer, but for a long period of time, immunotherapy was uh, almost uh, uh, failing in, uh, in every trial that was, uh, uh, that was planned in the field of, of non-small cell lung cancer, as well as in other thoracic malignancies. Uh, can you review briefly the uh, data that uh, came up uh, in the last few years about the role of vaccines in, uh, in lung cancer. Yeah, there have been a, a, a number of trials in that area. Be, the, the biggest one is the, uh, the MAGE uh, trial, the trial sponsored by uh, GlaxoSmithKline, a huge trial uh, incorporating uh, patients selected after surgery on the presence of a certain antigen and these patients were um, some of them based on their staging uh, treated with chemotherapy after the operation and then they got uh, vaccination or no vaccination so they screened around 10,000 patients ending up with a trial of a little bit more than I think 2,200 cases uh, and this trial has been presented um, uh, its first analysis at the uh, ESMO meeting in Madrid uh, last year and unfortunately this very large trial is a negative trial so apparently this single approach of using a vaccine in these cases is not uh, uh, did not translate in any survival benefit is that the end of the story for um, vaccination I'm not sure there are studies going on uh, still in higher stage patients, so uh, stage 3, stage 4. Uh, these studies are underway. Uh, it's unclear what will be the outcome. And 
another thing that was brought up uh, in the discussion is is vaccination one should vaccination be one part of the treatment and should other things be added to this so this this big trial had a lot of patients had chemotherapy and vaccination but there are now other approaches as well such as the uh, immuno checkpoint inhibitors and maybe a combination of these things could revitalize what has been so far unsuccessful with vaccination. So maybe you can address that point uh, from the perspective of what is the current situation on the Im immuno checkpoint inhibitors, what is the, the level of registration, uh, where are they going to be used, and what are the potential perspectives of these new approaches in the earlier stage situation as well? Well, obviously, uh, the, as you said, the vaccination is only a way to modulate uh, what we can easily call the immunity, the immunity cycle. And the immunity cycle is starting with uh, antigen presentation. And the antigen presentation is not always optimal in the field of, of lung cancer because uh, uh, the, antigen, the, the, the antigen presentation in lung cancer usually is, is low even if we, you are dealing with uh, some kind of tumor-associated antigens. And the vaccination could be a way to increase uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, 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 this low antigenicity of, uh, of lung cancer. But there are other ways uh, that are trying to interfere with this kind of immune escape that we usually see in different solid tumors. This is, has been proven uh, several times uh, using the, the melanoma models, but uh, this is, can be in some way extended also to other solid tumors. And uh, obviously the way in which we, are, we can modulate this level of immunosuppression that we, we potentially have uh, between the tumor uh, uh, associated macrophages that they have the role of presenting the antigens to T cells as well as the presence of uh, T regulatory cells and myeloid derived uh, suppressor cells in the context of the tumor microenvironment. It's a complex story. So what we learned over the last five years is that we can modulate, we can inhibit this uh, uh, immunosuppression using specific monoclonal antibodies that are directed versus uh, specific uh, antigen that are expressed either on, on, on tumor-associated macrophages, on the tumor cells itself, or on, on the T cells. And there are two major ways, using monoclonal antibody against uh, an antigen or a receptor that is called uh, CTL4A, uh, and the other one is interfering with the pathway that is uh, uh, using the PD-1 and the PDL one interaction. Uh, the the CTL4A uh, story was investigated uh, using ipilimumab um, four or five years ago in a relatively large uh, three-arm study by Dr. Lynch and co-workers and the, what they called one single arm that they call phased epilumumab plus chemotherapy. That means starting with chemotherapy and using epilumumab starting from cycle four was uh, more active in terms of efficacy compared to the combination of immunotherapy and cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, starting on, on day one versus uh, the uh, uh, the use of, uh, of uh, combination uh, chemotherapies uh, or combination chemotherapy because it was mainly the combination of carboplatin and taxane, either taxol or taxotil. Uh, <clears throat> the, the phased epilumomod shows some uh, uh, benefit, but not definitively striking benefit, especially in terms of overall survival. There were some uh, some uh, me, uh, uh, higher level of evidence in squamous compared to non-squamous histology 
in that uh, that uh, uh, efficacy finding led to a phase three study that is still ongoing comparing carbotaxol and carbotaxol epilumumab in the setting of squamous uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. But the, the, the more exciting evidence came uh, from uh, uh, the use of monoclonal antibody interfering or blocking PD-1 or PDL one uh, either in, in second line uh, of uh, non-squamous and uh, squamous uh, histologies. And uh, now, just recently, just in the latest day, we got uh, information that one of these agents, nivolumumab, has been approved for second-line treatment of, uh, of squamous histology based uh, on a phase three study that has been stopped on, uh, on the uh, uh, outcome of a uh, interim analysis and the Independent Data Monitoring Committee was convinced about uh, the superiority of the experimental arm versus the control arm represented by, by Taxotere because the amount of benefit in terms of uh, overall survival was exceeding the expectation of the, of the original study design. I believe personally that is still the beginning of the story uh, and uh, we need to get much more data in the, in the, in the squamous histology itself but also in non-squamous histology and probably uh, this year at ASCO on, on the oncoming meetings before the end of 2015 we will be able probably to get more information about, uh, about this uh, specific uh, area of, uh, of treatment and obviously there are also trials that are investigating the role of immune checkpoint concomitantly with chemotherapy or sequentially after induction chemotherapy. What is a, a general information that should, uh, should be available to everyone? Uh, these kind of agents are working nicely in, in patients who are heavy smokers. That is really something that in our clinical practice potentially may be a game changer, at least in second line for, for, for the evidence that we have uh, 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 currently available. The other point is that uh, there is a long-standing discussion about uh, potential biomarkers. Personally, I do not believe that just uh, assessing through immunostochemistry the, uh, positivity, the positivity for PDL1 will be the way to move forward. It's true that is a sort of enrichment uh, criterion, but it's not definitively proven as the sole biomarker of efficacy. But it's quite unlikely that uh, picking up one single biomarker, we will be able to select the most ap appropriate subgroup in this setting. Also considering that you need to have uh, at least another player that is represented by the immuno T cells, that if they are not present, for instance, in the context of the tumor, it's quite unlikely that uh, uh, just blocking one will in the system, we will be able to modulate the immune system. Now, after talking about the, immuno, the immunotherapy in lung cancer, I would like to, to switch to another important issue that is, uh, is, is a matter of, uh, of uh, debate. It is the molecular profiling having, having uh, the increased accessibility to uh, these wonderful machines represented by the uh, sequencing machines. Uh, the molecular profiling is coming into the stage quite quickly, so we are not just uh, investigating the presence of the EGFR mutation or the alt translocation, but we are moving forward. Can we get an, an opinion, your personal opinion about that? Now, what you now see is that since, let's say, about 10 years, EGFR mutation analysis is in place. It's now widespread and easily available, so I think this is, has become common practice. So the field is now moving forward uh, because after the first generation of TKIs, Latinib and Gefitinib, the second generation has been there, but now it's also the third generation and 
that brings into focus the, uh, the importance of uh, profiling again and again the tumor uh, in these patients. So these patients are on a therapy, they progress, and then. So what has become clear now that even if they progress, they might still continue with the initial treatment and have some additional treatment for the side that is causing problems, for instance, brain metastasis or bone, bone metastasis, it could be irradiated and then temporarily stopped or hold the treatment. But on the other hand, if the progression is uh, very severe, so it's really uh, a matter of you have to change your treatment, there are now new drugs coming on the market, so that is a drug from Clovis Oncology, CO1686, uh, as well as uh, uh, AZD92. Nine, one, which are specifically targeting the most common um, mutation in EGFR in these patients as they ha are progressing after first-line TKI. So that's a, specifically against the T790N. So that is one part of what is now becoming more or less daily practice very soon, as well as there are other uh, mechanisms through which these tumors escape the initial sensitivity for uh, the first-line TKIs. So there might be MAT, they might uh, change to HER2 uh, 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 now. Uh, so these new targets are potential targets that could be uh, attacked as well to bring these patients back into remission again. Having said that, there's always still the possibility of going with these patients along the old lines of giving them chemotherapy if they're progressing and then again after some time of treatment with chemotherapy progressing again rebiopsy and see what is the situation of the tumor at that stage so there have been a number of trials and uh, smaller studies as well in which the uh, reinduction of the initial TKI proved to be beneficial so this, this field is really, regarding EGFR, is really a, a, a moving field in which there's a lot of development. The other area where is also a lot going on, that is the, the tumors with the ALK translocation, so the ML4 ALK. Um, and these patients are now the optimal candidates for the drug that was first coming to the market, that is crisotinib, but there's already an, the next generation available that's uh, recently got registration, that is sidirinib, which is um, kind of second-line anti-ALK drug, which is uh, as effective uh, in this second-line situation of being resistant to the first-line crisotinib. So this field is also a, a, a changing very much. So then there are smaller groups for which there are specific targets like the BRAF and as I said how to know uh, for which there is specific treatment as well. So this, this stresses very much that these patients need to be characterized by the pathologist and the molecular pathologist very carefully to prevent that they will not be treated with the optimal treatment based on their molecular profile. So if I understood correctly, you are addressing the, the issue of optimizing the amount of tissue material available, uh, saving as much as possible the material for molecular analysis. Absolutely. The second point that you were stressing in your, uh, in your highlight is that probably we need to repeat the biopsy, or we need to convince the patient to uh, under, undergo another seco, another biopsy at the time, time of relapse because it's not sufficient to get one uh, slot at baseline and not having the, the real uh, actual picture at the time of the relapse because probably the better understanding of the mechanism of resistance is probably the next challenge for us as a clinician yes. because we have different choices. Yeah, and it's, it's, it is, it's a bit difficult to say whether it is resistance or whether it is selection of clones of a, of a tumor, which is more or less by definition a heterogeneous tumor. So that makes it really very important that you get 
as much information at any time that you have to make a decision on the treatment on what is the, the profile of this tumor at that stage. Yeah, the other point that was, uh, was surprising me is uh, 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 concerning the uh, T719 inhibiting agents like the AZ agent as, or the Clovis compound is the mild toxicity profile so they don't have uh, compared to the second the first and the second generation EGFR TKI they have relatively few uh, off target effects that is making me positive on this uh, on this uh, type of agents also considering that they have uh, a reasonable level of activity against EGFR sensitizing mutation. So it's quite likely that they will not remain forever as a, as a second line agent in the EGFR mutants, but potentially in the near future they will become also first line agents. And this is leading me also to another, uh, to another interesting finding that is the uh, coexistence from, from the baseline of the EGFR sensitizing mutation and T790 mutation, that by definition is only in a minority of patients, but it could be a way also to start from baseline with this latest generation of agents. Yeah, or combining these agents uh, at some, some point in time might be uh, a thing that needs to be at least thought about and uh, maybe uh, tested as well in a number of studies to, to find out what is the optimal use of these anti-EGFR uh, drugs. So, what you said about the toxicity um, is an, certainly an advantage for the newer drugs, but makes it also much easier for us as doctors to convince patients that it is necessary to go through the unpleasant experience of going for a new biopsy, for instance, by a bronchoscopy or a surgical biopsy, because the treatment that might come out of that is a relatively easy, tolerable treatment for these patients. Before stepping in the last topic that I would like to discuss with you, uh, let's go back to this second generation ARC inhibitors, because uh, what is, uh, at least for me, an interesting story is the, this uh, uh, extremely high level of activity against prey metastasis of this second generation ALK inhibitors. I'm not saying that carisotinib is totally inactive uh, against brain metastasis. I'm saying that uh, I'm, I was really impressed by the extremely high level of activity of these agents, uh, either in, in the general population for those uh, who received previously carisotinib, but especially for those patients with brain metastasis where almost 60% of the patients are responsive to the treatment. So that, that apparently illustrates that these uh, drugs have a different uh, level of penetration into the, uh, the cerebrum. Um, I'm not aware of uh, data on how high the levels in the cerebrospinal fluid are of these drugs um, in the ALK uh, translocated population, but having said that this, the observation that the, 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 the next generation uh, anti-ALK is um, more active against the brain might make it much easier for these drugs to be put in the forefront because that is certainly an advantage over chrysotinib um, and these patients have a very high risk of developing symptomatic brain mass, so the longer you can delay that, the better it would be. So that would be a reason for me to try to bring these drugs as soon as possible, soon as possible to the forefront in the treatment of this type of specific subgroup of adenocarcinomas. Let's walk to the, to the last topic that I would like to discuss with you. Well, we are talking nicely about molecular profiling. At the end of the game, only 10 to 15% of our patients are getting benefit from targeted therapies. The remaining 85% of the patients with nosmo cell lung cancer are still receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy. 
And obviously, it's a matter of fact that we are using cytotoxic chemo chemotherapy differently according to the uh, uh, histological classification, uh, pulling together the non squamous histology versus the squamous histology. The squamous histology is still treated with, uh, with combo, uh, cis platinum or carboplatin based plus a third generation agent. It could be either taxanes, uh, gemcitabine, or vinorabine. While we have different options for non squamous, as you know, uh, one, one uh, choice could be the combination of cisplatin and pemetrexed based on the outcome of a relatively uh, done uh, clinical trials comparing cisplatin gemcitabine versus cisplatin pemetrexed, or the alternative hypothesis to use carboplatin paclitaxel plus. Uh, an antiangiogenetic uh, agent that is bevacizumab, but this is not nothing new. I believe that the most important uh, information along the last uh, 12 months came from, from second line uh, treatment opportunities, especially in the field uh, of non squamous histology. And I believe that uh, you was excited uh, as a clinician about uh, having new treatment opportunities in second line, especially in the field of antiangiogenetic therapy. Yeah, so there are now for the first time two new drugs, so two anti-angiogenic drugs that um, are probably going to make it in second line treatment. So the one is nintadenib, which is uh, in combination with docetaxel proven to be uh, better than those that tax on a single agent, especially in those who have a early progression. And the other drug is uh, ramasurimab, which is uh, another monoclonal antibody that has, again in combination with those that tax all, uh, proven to be better than those that tax alone. So this is the first, uh, really the first moment in time that we, uh, we have now anti-angiogenic therapy in second-line treatment uh, coming available for patients with lung cancer. So that is, that's really new. So can you comment a little bit about the uh, type of toxicity that uh, has been observed in the, in the two uh, phase three randomized clinical study, either with uh, ramasirumab plus uh, docetaxa or nimdetanib and, uh, and docetaxa? Now what you see with the nintadenib that is there is uh, some gastrointestinal toxicity as far as I know uh, regarding diarrhea. Um, this is controllable so patients are tolerating this drug rather well. For ramasurimab I think you need to help me because uh, I have not sufficient knowledge of the details of this study so maybe you can add that yourself? Well, for, to the best of my knowledge, the, the, most of the toxicities came from, uh, from, the, from the use of, of, of docetaxel. Obviously, there was a sort of additive toxicity in terms of hematological and mainly in terms of non-hematological toxicities, but the amount of, uh, of grade 3 and 4 toxicity were in, on the average, uh, uh, the, the percentage was, was low. So, in, in general, I believe that uh, you will agree with me that we are not talking in, in this specific field of, of second line about the innovation as we were talking before about targeted therapies in, 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 in lung cancer. We can easily talk about the evolution of the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer in the second line setting. There is still a huge room for improvements probably in the near future through different ways, uh, trying to tailor also the second, light the second light treatment in a better way through molecular uh, uh, parameters or through clinical uh, parameters. Uh, this is still uh, a question mark. But I believe that uh, uh, we can easily state that recently we, we, we got an, an evolution in a relatively uh, an uh, unstable field and unmet uh, uh, need area for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer as the second line uh, was. Uh, with that, I'm closing this uh, best of the day about uh, European perspectives in lung cancer held in Torino 
in, uh, in, at the beginning of March uh, 2015. I thank for your participation in this audience. I'm Giorgio Scagliotti, Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Torino.